a special treat. It was stirred in my heart. Uh, stirred in my heart, not just for tonight, but for tonight and uh, and this weekend. Just a lot of things. Uh, the Lord just been speaking, and I got to hang uh, hang in my truck for a long period of time today, and just pump in the Word, uh, and kind of just getting ready for this weekend, and just random messages uh, filling me up. But really, it's, it's just amazing how it, there are just all these pieces coming together for for even this weekend. But tonight we got a special treat because Pastor Susan, she's in town. Come on, my this is my mama in law. This is my spiritual mother. Come on. Miss Susan Fletcher. So this is Susan Fletcher. Hold on. This is uh, this is my little spiritual mama, and um, and and as a, as a young man, just uh, 12, 13, she gave us God talks, gave me God talks, and you know, there's nothing like when you're hungry hearing God speak to you, and I'm excited to hear that tonight. So, woo, God talks. Oh, wait, there's a little baby one up here. I don't need this big one. <laughs> Did they tell you you're in for a really long night? <laughs> you can tell by the water bottle. <laughs> okay, anyways. Oh, gosh. That last song, I've never heard that song, but I want to. That song. Right? Wow. Um. You know, I heard something in my heart about the Lord saying, you know, when we're saying to him, do whatever you want to. How many of you, well, you're going to feel like you need to raise your hand. Maybe you should raise your hand but, because I'm asking about it. But how many of you, like when you're singing that, didn't you mean that? Don't we just want God to, to do whatever he wants to do in us and through us? And um, when I was singing that to him, the scripture popped up into my head, into my spirit. And uh, one of the places it's found is Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. And Jesus said this. This is not what I gave you guys, sorry. It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And, um, you know, you're his house. I'm his house. And a lot of people are searching in this time, you know, what is God's plan? What is his purpose for me? This is part of it. Um, that we would be his house of prayer. That's something that he wants to do through us. And we're actually going to look at that a little bit tonight, okay? So praise God. Let's pray together. Father, we love you so much. And, you know, um, we want you to do through us what you want to do. We want to be available to work with you, to share Jesus with others, to serve your church, but, Father, also to partner with you in prayer. We want to do that. And, Lord, as I was praying in the front there, it's just my prayer, Lord, light a prayer fire in us. If it's already there, just we're praying tonight for that fire to be, um, that flame to be fanned, that it would grow, that it would increase for people that have maybe wondered, can I pray or what is prayer? I don't even like to pray. Father, I'm praying tonight, open our eyes and do a work in us by the Holy Spirit that only you can do. We're asking you to do something special tonight. Because the time is short and you are coming soon and there is still much to be done. So open our eyes tonight and Lord, I'm asking you, just give me utterance. Say what you want to say tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so you guys, I love, um, and Landon was sharing this tonight. You know, he mentioned about knowing him and making him known. And I love that we, um, we also use that where we are because I just don't think there's a better way to say it. I really don't. Um, part of what your purpose is is found in Mark 16 and then um, verse, beginning with verse 15. You know, it's the Great Commission. If you've ever wondered why am I here, what's my purpose, that seems to be a huge question people have. Um, why am I here? 
and what's my purpose? And honestly, it's found right in this passage. This is it. This is why when we're born again, we're not just raptured out of here right then. We're here because God's given us this amazing assignment, and we all have a part in it. So it says, beginning with verse 16, and he, Jesus, said to them, go into all the world. And actually, that really carries this connotation. As you go, take the gospel. So forget about necessarily you got to be sent somewhere across the world. Some of you may be. We were. I didn't expect to be. But the, the, the whole idea of this is that as you go, let him be seen through you. Take the gospel everywhere. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. We'll go to verse 17. These signs shall follow those who believe in my name. They'll cast out devils. This is you. You're a devil casting out person. Okay? Speaking with new tongues. Taking up serpents. If you drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt you. COVID, you don't have to be afraid of COVID. All right. And guess what else? This is part of what we're to do. Lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. This gospel is a show and tell gospel. And I love that. And it's only done in the power of the Holy Spirit. So this totally defines our purpose. Um, and we've been given this amazing gift of freedom twofold for us as Christians. Number one, the Bible says we've been liberated in Christ. If the Son has set you free, what are you? Free. What? Say that again. Free. free. Free is a good word. It is good to be free. Have you ever been somewhere and they want to give you something free? That's kind of exciting. Free is a good word. Freedom is an even better word. Okay, so we've been given freedom twofold. We've been given freedom in Christ, but we've also been blessed with this amazing gift in this country called freedom. Okay, but I want us to understand, I'm laying a little foundation for where we're going to go. We are going to talk about prayer tonight, but I want us to understand um, what freedom is all about. 1 Corinthians 9, 19, <clears throat> excuse me, says this. For although I am free in every way from anyone's control, I have made myself a bond servant to everyone so that I might gain more for Christ. What we see in the gospel is that freedom is a gift that's been given to us to use for the kingdom. Okay? Galatians 5.13 says this, and I know they're popping those up. Thank you guys for that. For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity or excuse for selfishness, but through love you should serve one another. So you know what? In this day and age, what we're seeing is this. We're seeing a clash of kingdoms. The kingdom of God has... Um, a definition for freedom. And you know what it is? It is empowerment to bring the love and the power of God to people who need him. That's what freedom's about. We've been set free so that we are free to fulfill our purpose that we've been given. And guess what else? To spread freedom everywhere we go. Freedom is a good thing. Freedom is not a bad thing. Freedom is not evil. Freedom is a good thing. And then the clash is with the kingdom of this world, and the kingdom of this world says freedom is about me. The kingdom of God says freedom is about others. We're free to help other people get free. The spirit of the world says this, I'm free and that means this. I get to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. I get to act however I want. Everything should be the way I want it in life. Freedom is to serve me. It's for me. But that's a clash of kingdoms. 
And you know what? If we don't understand the foundation of our freedom, we're not going to use freedom as a tool for the kingdom of God. Instead, we're just going to use it as an excuse to do just what he said, to do whatever we want to do to fuel our flesh and our selfish desires and our selfish motives. And we're seeing a, a lot of that in the Western world, not just here, but all over. Freedom's being used to fuel selfish motives and desires. It's not being used for the gospel. But make no mistake about it, this country was birthed and raised up for freedom to be used the right way. Okay? And the nation I'm from, the same thing. All right. So freedom is really, really important, and it has an impact. Um, it has an impact on what we're going to talk about tonight, which is prayer. We're seeing, um, okay, so there's the spiritual freedom we've been given, and one of the outworkings of what Christ did are the natural freedoms we've been given in our country. And we could say freedom like the freedom to assemble, the freedom to worship, the freedom, um, I, how do I want to say this, um, the freedom of conscience, and that is the ability to live out of your heart, a born-again heart, a heart. When you begin to take the gospel away from the foundation of freedom, it gets turned, freedom gets turned really quickly into something else. All right, so what does this have to do with prayer, you might ask? Well, part of what we're supposed to do as Christians, what God needs us to do, you know, whatever you want to do whatever you want to. Well, there's some stuff he wants to do. There are things he wants to do in this community, in our lives. There are things he wants to do in this nation, through this nation. God is not done yet. There is a harvest to come out of this nation. There is a harvest to come out of the world, and God's not done yet. But he needs us to use our freedom to advance his kingdom. Not our own agendas, not our own opinions, not our own ideas, but to advance his kingdom. And one of the ways we do it, a powerful way we do it, of course we know, is to share the gospel with people. But another powerful way is through this amazing, supernatural thing that God created called prayer. All right? So, 1 John 5.19. So what does this have to do with prayer? 1 John 5.19. Listen to what the scripture says. We know positively that we are of God. We're born again. We're of God. How many of you tonight are in God's family? We're part of his kingdom. We've been born again. We know positively that we are of God. And the whole world around us is under the power of the evil one. Yeah. So there's lots of questions. Why do bad things happen? Right there. God's reputation, his character gets assassinated all the time. But he is not the one doing it. All right? King James of that same scripture, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies, lieth in darkness. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Have you ever run into people like that? It's not that they're always just, you know, maybe hard-headed or rebellious or whatever. There is an enemy who is working to keep them in the dark. And one of the ways that we work with God is by allowing him to use us to pray for them. 
okay? Because the enemy is working, there is darkness around, and God is wanting his light to shine through. You're born again because light reached you. That's the only difference between us and somebody who's not saved. Light came to us. I'm really grateful that light came to us. The people that are in the world around us who are not born again, who, you know, things that are going on in the world around us, listen, they're not our enemies. God loves them, and they need us to be the church and to do what God wants us to do, which is pray. All right, so let's see here. I'm jumping all over the place. All right, so we come to this. In very simple terms, there are two ways, we're just going to talk about two, but two ways that we work with God to bring forth his light into this very dark world. And, and by doing this, see, we're using our freedom, the opportunity to assemble. We're just starting to be able to assemble again after seven months. Let me just tell you something. Freedom is an amazing gift. All right? We need to use it for the kingdom. So number one, get full of the word. And I heard that tonight, too. You know, it was like about breaking down walls of religion. It's about getting things out. It's about filling up with God. So, and it is. We got to get full of the word, and then we share the word. That's a great way that we work with God. And the next one is prayer. And this is where we're going to really spend our time tonight. First Timothy chapter 2 Verses 1 through 4. First Timothy 2, 1 through 4. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, whenever you see something like that, that's like priority talk. If somebody says, if, you know, you say, parents, to your kids, here's what I want you to do first, then you know right away, that's like a priority. I want to be sure out of all the things, out of this whole list, First, I want you to do this. And this is what God says. First of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We're going to look at the all men tonight. And then it does describe all men. For kings and for all that are in authority. Now, before anybody clicks off, because I know you've heard about praying for leaders and for people because you're taught really well here. And I thank God for that. But I want you to see how essential this part is to the gospel commission that we've been given. Preaching and teaching and testifying and sharing the word alone is not enough. There must be prayer. There must be. And if it's not us, who's going to do it? We're called of God. We're part of the body of Christ. He's living in us. We're the people that are saying whatever you want to. Do whatever you want to. So here's what he's saying. And this is what he says. That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. That's amazing. There's a perk to that. But then here's what it leads to. The Bible says it's good, acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Here's where it leads. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Prayer contributes, and I will put forward to you, is essential um, and we cannot do without it if we want to see the harvest come in. We have to have both. It's like the two legs you walk on. You can have one leg gone. It's going to be a lot harder to get around. You're not going to be able to move as effectively. It's going to take you longer to get anything done. We have to have both legs. We have to have prayer and we have to have people sowing the seed of the word. Okay, but notice here how important this is. And I love that God is so strategic. God gives us a hint at strategy. And he says, basically this, make sure in all your praying, it's interesting. He doesn't say pray for yourself. 
pray just for your family. Pray only for, you know, uh, whatever your need might be for the day. Can we pray for those things? Should we? Yes. But I want you to hear his priority talk. First of all, pray for, this is strategic, people who are influencers, leaders. A basic definition of leadership is influence. So when we're talking about praying for people who are in positions of leadership, these are people who have um, influence over masses of other people. There are a lot of leaders that fall into this category. All right. Um, so I want you to see here, let's see. I've got so many little things here. Sorry, I'm trying to really get through it all. Um, I had some things written in here. I'm trying to find it. All right. Anyway, so we're to pray for leaders. And what happens when we pray is we invite God into everything we pray about. Through prayer, we're inviting God's involvement and we're actually calling for his power and ability and might to go to work for the people and the situations that we're praying for. Have you ever needed God's help? Have you ever needed supernatural help? I have, and I will tell you, I do. Do you think our nation needs supernatural help? I do. Do you think that people can fix what's broken? I don't. I think we need greater help than that. I think we need the Lord. We need his help. We need him involved in everything. Every part of government, every part of education, we need him involved. And here's how he created it and made it to be. We're partners with him in prayer. When we ask, did you realize that your ask was that powerful? Your asking in faith brings God's power on the scene. Complaining doesn't do that. Being fed up doesn't do that. Anybody been there? <laughs> I know you have. So we've got leaders who are making decisions that influence culture, politics, government, laws, policies. This is what they're doing every day. And unfortunately, in the body of Christ, because we've kind of made our Christianity political, we withhold our prayers sometimes from the people we don't like. Or we didn't vote for. But it's not about politics. It's about God's power, and it's about his plan, and it's about his kingdom. And when we do, if we will just simply do what he said do, he'll do what he said he would do, which is so cool to me. So decisions that are being made by these influencers, they will either help advance the spread of the gospel or those decisions will impede the spread of the gospel. What direction do you think we've been going? I'm going to ask that again. What direction do you think we've been going? I can tell you in the years I've been alive, quite a few years, that I have watched it go in the wrong direction. And, you know, that doesn't line up with the Bible. Because if the church is doing what we're supposed to be doing, then things are going to go in a direction where um, I know that there are governments and things that are going to go on. I know that things are going to happen. But harvest, would we would see more of the harvest coming in. Okay? So this is important. Um, all right. So, again, praying for, and I love that, we're to pray for. So it's not about who we like or don't like. In fact, probably the people we don't like the most or agree with the most really need us to pray the most. Not only for them, but sometimes it's just something God wants to do in us as well. So we just, 
I will say this. God has only one side. You know what side that is? His word. He sides, he sides with his word. All right. So we're not picking sides. We're not even talking about sides. Except for kingdoms. We want to do his kingdom work. We want to be on his side. All right. Here's something that Jesus said. So anyway, this is really to help just stir the fire for you to pray. Matthew 8, sorry, Matthew 6, verses 8 through 13. And I like this translation, the TPT. And this is the, the, the Our Father prayer, you know. There is no need to imitate them since your father already knows what you have need of before you ask him. Notice that. God knows what we need before we ask. He knows the outcome before we ask, but he still says ask. You know why? Because he made us partners, and that's what partners do. We ask, he gets involved. Your ask is powerful. He's waiting for our ask. Okay? So it goes on and says, pray like this, our Father dwelling in the heavenly realms, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth just as it is fulfilled in heaven. Jesus said, pray this way. You know what that says to me? If we're to pray for God's will to be done on the earth, that means that things that are going on in the world, a lot of those things, it's just not the will of God. But they can be changed if we'll pray. Okay? James 5.16 and the second part of that verse says this, and this is the Amplify Classic, the earnest, heartfelt, and continued prayer of a righteous man, we could say a, a righteous woman, a righteous young person. If you're in Christ, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This is talking about you. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man, listen to this, makes tremendous power available and it's dynamic in its working. When we withhold our prayers, when we don't pray, there is dynamic power that God is wanting to release into situations to change men, women's lives, to change the outcome of a direction that we're headed. But there's no power being released. His power is released through us, through our prayers. And you may not understand that because it is, it is um, you know, the spiritual realm is so much more real than this natural realm. Prayer is not just a natural thing we do. You know, oh, Lord, just bless our day. No. Prayer is accessing heaven's power. It is supernatural. And when we pray and work with the Holy Spirit, God's power is released out of us into the situations and for the people that we're praying for. How can there not be change when God's power is released to work? That's the very thing we need. And yet we'll, you know, I just can't believe what these crazy people are doing. I just can't they see? Can't they know? Can't, don't they know what they're doing? I don't think they know what they're doing. Well, you're right. They don't. They need heaven's help. And as the church, we've got to, um, we've got to let him do what he wants to do through us. All right. So here's some ways I just wrote down when we talk about prayer because we got to wrap up here in a little bit. But um, all right. Hmm. I have a lot of stuff. So what is prayer, first of all? Well, you know, people say prayer is talking to God, which it is. It's fellowshipping with him, and we're reliant on him. We know that prayer is to be directed to God. So when um, I'm praying corporately, I'm not praying to you. I'm praying to him. When I'm praying on my own, I'm not praying to anyone else. I'm praying to him. Prayer is to be directed to him. 
First Corinthians. So we're going we're gonna to talk about some different ways here that we can be effective in prayer. And I'll go over some of these things. But um, one of them is this. First Corinthians 14, 2 Corinthians 14.2. So we can pray the word. And very often, in fact, I encourage people. One of the best things you and I can do is to, is to um, hmm, how can I say this? We want to ensure that our prayers are pure. Do you know what I mean by that? Let me explain it. I'll try and explain it. That, that our prayers would not be motivated by our own desires or what we think is right, or a direction we think someone should go, a manipulative type of prayer. God can't be manipulated. People can be, but God can't be. And so what we want to do when we talk about prayer, what we're endeavoring to do is actually clear ourselves and let the Holy Spirit who's living on the inside of us have his way and pray how he wants to pray, what he wants to pray, about what he wants to pray about, whoever he wants to pray about. Just let him do what he's good at doing. And we just cooperate. That's what partners do. And we're partners. So a really great way to pray is to find scriptures in the Bible because the Bible um, is the will of God. It's the word of God, and God's word is his will. And when we go to pray for people, man, one of the best ways we can pray is to take the word of God and pray it. Pray it over your children. Pray it over leaders. As I do my daily Bible reading, there will be scriptures that come. It's just like they come alive in me, and I'm like, wow, I need to pray this over my family today. I need to pray this over your pastors today because they're my family. I need to pray this over our president today. I need to pray this about elections. I need to pray this for my prime minister today. And for me, what helps me in my journaling, I'll write it out, and then I highlight it, and I go back, and I will pray that over and over and over again. How can you go wrong praying what the word says? It keeps my opinions out. It keeps my motives out, and it just keeps things pure. Because here's the deal, we think we know, but there's so little we know, but we work with the one who knows everything. There's so much he knows. He knows the beginning, but he also knows the end and everything in between. He knows the motive of everyone's heart. He knows what everyone's thinking. He knows what's going on in the back rooms. He knows it all. And if we'll just cooperate with him, and pray along with him, it's a great thing. So that's a great way to pray. I also find that times when I'm praying, um, when I'm praying for other people, just trying to throw out nuggets quick before we go, but as I'm praying, um, I'll have a scripture come up in my heart. And sometimes it's one I know really well from memory. Sometimes as I start to pray it out, I realize I feel like I'm not quite getting that right. I will actually pause and find that scripture in the Bible, and I'll say to the Lord, I want to get it right, exactly how you put it. So there will be times, and as I do that, as I begin and I go to that scripture and begin to pray, what I have found is that there will be a part the Holy Spirit emphasizes. It could be a word, it could be a phrase, but there's so much light that comes with that. And that light, in that light, it helps me to know better how to pray. It helps me. It brings answers to me about things that I've had questions about. So praying the word is so powerful. Get in the word and pray the word. So here's another powerful way. Am I going too long? Do I have time? Here's another really powerful way to pray, and it's found in 1 Corinthians 14, 2. You guys have been on hold for a long time. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Thank you for staying with me. 
And it says, For one who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but to God. Here's prayer again. All right? For no one understands or catches his meaning because, listen to this, this is great. In the Holy Spirit, we could say with the help of the Holy Spirit, he utters secret truths and hidden things not obvious to the understanding. One thing that I have found so helpful in prayer, and I could say it this way. When I take the word, and I do that a lot, I take the word and I pray the word over our leaders. And I pray the word into situations and things. But sometimes I come to the end of what I know, what I know to pray. And I feel like I'm not done praying. How do I keep praying when I've come to the end of what I know to pray, but I also know that more needs to be prayed? Here's what I do. I pray in other tongues. Because this is the most amazing thing. God has given us as believers, everyone can be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak with other tongues. It's something for every believer. But as we begin to yield, the the amazing thing about this is that we have access, well, we do anyways, but we have access to what God knows and we, you know, what he wants to pray about. Let me put it that way. What he wants to pray about. We can pray for people. We can pray for situations. We have absolutely no natural understanding about, and we can do it by praying in other tongues. Because, see, the things that are uttered here, secret truths and hidden things, they're not secret and hidden to the Lord. He knows everything. They're hidden and they're secret to us. But they can still be prayed about, which is amazing. So this combination of praying the word and then also praying in tongues is so powerful. All right, so uh, let's see. A few more scriptures. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 14 and 15. And I wanted to bring this out because praying in tongues is just, um, it bypasses your mind. And um, Brother Hagen, a, a man who's a father in the faith to me, he's gone home to be with the Lord now. But he used to say a great thing about praying in other tongues is you can begin to hook your heart up, what's in your heart, the Holy Spirit is living in you, with your mouth. And I don't know about you, but there are lots of times when things come out of my mouth and I'm like, what? I should not have said that. Whether it's, you know, frustration or something mean or nasty or complaining or whatever it could be. But I found that the more I yield to the Holy Spirit on the inside of me with praying in other tongues, the more, um, the more um, I find that my mouth begins to get hooked up with the one who's in me, and he's love, and he's good, and he's kind, and he's for people. So this says, for when I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays. We can pray out of our understanding. That's not a bad way to pray. We just have to be sure it's in line with the word. But we can also pray with our spirit, by the Holy Spirit who's within us, the scripture says. And even though we may not always understand everything we're praying about, Pastor Nate and uh, Pastor Evan and I were just briefly talking last night. But there are times, and as you pray in some of the prayer groups here, you'll be exposed to this, where the Holy Spirit will give interpretation. He'll begin to give you the words of things you're praying about in other tongues. And that gives you greater understanding on a lot of things, what you need to do, in situations, um, how you need to pray more effectively, okay? But you got to start with what you have and use with what you've been given. 
And it says this, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. Both are great. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. The Amplified Classic says, my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me prays. So you know what? By praying in other tongues, you know what it also does? Helps increase our awareness of the greater one who's living in us. Because he's the one that's giving us the words. All right, Romans 8, 26 through 28. And we'll be finishing up. So too, the Holy Spirit comes to our aid. Isn't he good? And he bears us up in our weakness. For we do not know what prayer to offer it or how to offer it worthily as we ought. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt like, I'm not sure how to pray about this? Praise God, the Holy Spirit can help us. He goes to meet our supplication and he pleads in our behalf with unspeakable yearnings and groanings too deep for utterance. And then it goes on and says, and he who searches the hearts of men, he knows what is the mind of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God. And by the way, plead is not begging here. It's a legal term, like pleading your case, just so you know, it's not begging. Because the Spirit intercedes and pleads before God in behalf of the saints, sometimes Maybe in our selfishness, we would want to pray against saints. Have you ever heard that? Somebody say, I'm praying against that. I don't think, I don't know, blah, 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 blah. But the Holy Spirit, he prays for. When the Holy Spirit is prompting our prayers, he prays for. He prays for heaven's help. He prays for revelation. He prays for strength. He prays for right steps. He prays for people's minds and hearts to be flooded with light so that they can know the way to go. He's so good. The same Holy Spirit that is for you is for that other Christian. And he's also for those leaders. That doesn't mean he may condone everything that they're doing, but he loves them. He wants them born again. And let me tell you, when we pray for our leaders, that should be a key thing. Pray for their salvation. Pray for those who are leaders that are born again. Pray for them. Often people that are born again get into these leadership positions, and then there's no more prayer. Oh, phew, they're in. No, that's when they really need it. Because there is so much pressure on them to, remember, influencers are strategic. And they're, yeah, they are targeted. And the enemy is going to bring a lot of pressure to bear to get them to go the wrong way, to take people further from the truth instead of into the truth and light. So, anyways... That's why we need to pray. That's why we need to pray for our leaders, our nation. It's why you need to take your place. Your ask is powerful. Your prayers are powerful. And my prayer for you is that this just lights a fire in you to pray. Because if there was ever a time for the church to arise... And I've prayed it this way. I've seen it in my heart. We're going down before we're going up. And that to me is what I see in my heart is down on our knees before the Lord. This is a place of humility and honor where we say to the Lord, we can't do this without you. We can't make it without you. We have to have you. The answer is not a political party. The answer is not man's wisdom. The answer is the Lord. And that's who we need. Yeah. Pastor Nate, Pastor Evan, you want to come up and. I'm done. Okay. He's got something. That's a good word. Aren't you thankful for that? And um, I would just encourage you, you know, uh, she's actually the one that prayed with me to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
and uh, it's a January series. Uh, it's so cool. I'm just going to take two minutes here to close. Um, just kind of to tell you a little story. How's that? Um, I have, we to talk to our staff yesterday, or actually last week, just talking about as we're coming into the end of the year and the holidays and so on and so forth, there's always a lot to do, right? And it always feels like there's more to do than there is time. And so we kind of just talked about a strategy. Uh, and then one of these things on the strategy um, uh, was to lay out a January. Uh, what, am, what, what do I feel like as a church, where we're at, all these kind of things as I've come into the end of the year and so on and so forth. And and today I just dropped into my heart real clearly. And um, we're going to be talking about foundations uh, and foundational doctrines. And the Bible talks about six doctrines that we need to know. And uh, I don't think that we know them well enough uh, as, as the church. Uh, one of them would be the laying on of hands. Um, uh, one of the other ones would be uh, of the six that's mentioned in Hebrews would be the baptisms. And the baptisms, there's actually three baptisms. There is a baptism that, that come, and this is what the Bible teaches, and this is what in, in, in Hebrews is Paul is teaching. He's saying, hey, y'all, I, I, it's really important that you grow up, but growing up, you got to know the ABCs, and the ABCs are one, two, three, four, five, six, these six things. And, um, and, and one of them, and, and again, is just simply bap baptisms, and that there's a baptism when we get baptized in Christ. And then there's a baptism that when we would be an outward declaration of what happened when we received Christ. And then there is also a baptism, and it's a baptism of the Spirit, which the Spirit would, you know, He would come on you, the Bible says in Acts, and you'd receive power to be a witness or to testify. And so these things are hugely and vitally important, and they're not weird, they're not spooky. They're actually the very tool that God said, it's better that I go away so I can give this to you. And so it's so vital that we have it. And I would, I would challenge you, um, even uh, if, if you're not filled with the Spirit, I would ask you, look in, and I say filled with the Spirit, that's, a, that's actually the wrong terminology. The, the, the Spirit of God, when you're born again, comes and makes His home on the inside. So you are filled upon, uh, upon giving your heart to Christ. But there is a Spirit upon you, okay? And, and that is uh, uh, when, when you are baptized in the Spirit, all right? And, and he rests upon you to be that witness. He is, in a sense, our paraclete, okay? That word para or para, uh, can't Greek pronunciation a lot of times, that's not my thing. But P-A-R-A, -A, right, means to go alongside. So he is the one that goes alongside or is right here upon me wherever I go and gives me the very thing to say that I wouldn't normally say because he, there's... Well, the same way, the ones that give me something to pray that I wouldn't normally pray. And um, anyway, and so before we close tonight, or, na or as we close tonight, um, the, the, one of the things of the doctrines that we're going to be talking about in the beginning of January is the doctrine of the laying on of hands. And that's one of those six doctrines. And you're like, oh, I just thought that was a charismatic thing that we did in the church, and maybe somebody would fall over or something. Or like, uh, you know, only spiritual people did. No, that's something that you need to be doing. And it's actually something at work. When someone, you see somebody that needs something or, or you, you, you're prompted in, in Walmart or wherever. Hey, can I pray with you? Can I, is it okay if I lay my hands on you? Why? Because there's a transfer of power upon laying on our hands. And that's what the Bible teaches. And we're going to look at that because these are things that we have to own. We're like, why are we not seeing more miracles? Well, have you been using your hands? If you haven't been using your hands, okay, this is one of the doctrines that you and I need to know that the Bible teaches and it lays it out all the way from the beginning. And so, so on and so forth. And I got all, I just pulled out two of those six doctrines that we have to know. We need to know clearly because they're so key to uh, the erection or the, the building up or the, 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 uh, of the body of Christ and, and, and their power gifts. The baptism of the Spirit, it's a power gift, the laying out of hands. It's, it's the, the transfer of the blessing. I mean, all the way from the very, very beginning, hey, laying hands on somebody, it was like he had to feel them. Is this, is this Jacob or is this Esau? No, he's hairy. It must be Esau. And he knew that when I laid my hands on you, that there would be a transfer. Well, we see the same thing with, when, when they were filled with the Spirit, Okay. And we see when it was first, uh, it was poured out. He poured out his spirit. Have you ever heard it said that the hand of the Lord is upon something? 
In other words, there's power upon it or there's presence upon it. It's the same thing. And all the way through Acts, and you'll see that uh, when someone got born again, um, and then here the disciples would come, and they'd say, hey, have you received this, this, this spirit? And they said, well, we have not so much as heard as this, the Holy Spirit. And so what happened is the, the disciples would lay their hands on them, and they would receive the spirit, and they would begin to speak in other tongues. That is the evidence of the spirit upon you, okay? And, it, and the spirit upon you, how many of you know that you have to, that, that is a, the release of your will, it's, a, it's a, not just a one-time thing. It's a continual thing, uh, to, a, a, a release of your will, and to be baptized or, or to let him rest upon you. And this is like just like what we were saying, singing tonight. Whatever you want to, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to do. Well, he's wanting to do a lot of things. And he's wanting to do it today. He's wanting to do it tomorrow. And he's wanting to do it the next day. And um, anyway, so I said all that to say, to close, uh, baptisms and laying on of hands, two doctrines. But if you're not filled with the Spirit, or excuse me, that's wrong terminology again. You see this? See how see how confusing this can be. We we and even in the as the church we use the wrong language, and therefore people don't have the right interpretation of what's being and they're, they're misunderstood. No, I have no. If you've never been baptized with the Spirit, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that will come to your aid when you don't know how to pray and how vital your prayers are. You just heard tonight. It, it's the key to the salvation. Of, of those that you love. It's key to the harvest coming in. It's key to God's will in your life, right? And the, His will and His thoughts and His plans for you that are good is key to your and my prayers. When you don't know how to pray God's will, what do you need? The Holy Spirit to come to your aid in your weakness when you don't know how to pray as you ought. So if that's you tonight as we dismiss, come forward. Uh, Pastor Susan, myself, will be up here. We'd love to lay hands on you and they maybe even get you a book if you're saying, I don't know. We have some Why Tongues books, which, in other words, why you have them. And the simplicity just lays it out. Let you see for yourself. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing God's word. And I know it maybe took me a little longer to say than two minutes. But here it is. That's good. So let's, if, that, if that's you, come forward. And, man, I'll tell you, be helped. Be helped in ways. And I'll tell you, when I got filled with the Spirit, excuse me, when I got baptized in the Spirit at camp, uh, in 1995, I, I got burned alive, 95, I got a, painted a rock and brought it home in my duffel bag. It was like a 40-pound rock, and it, it was a doorstop for many years. Um, but all my friends went out to play that evening and, and do night games, and I went into my, I was in my bunk uh, in the camp, and I just was praying in the spirit, and tears were just coming down my because it was something that I, I knew I needed. It was something that I was just given. It was something that was just, it was, I would say, the time that God was not just, it was more real. It was more tangible. It was more upon me rather than just in me or just like a, something that you go, yeah, I know that. Right? It's not just a, mm, a witness, but it's like a, it was like the tangible witness to me and to others. Amen? Amen. So with that, grab those kiddos, and we will see you Sunday morning for uh, a three, third part of the series, Grace, not to you, not grace through you, but grace for you. All right, so anyway, we'll see you.